Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Hale Svandiari, the director of the Middle East uh, program. Uh, this is the first in a series of meetings on the Iran uh, primer. Uh, we are planning to hold uh, six meetings through uh, 2011 discussing the main topics of the primer. The Iran primer project is a joint project by the United States Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's edited by Robin Wright, currently a USIP Wilson Center distinguished scholar. Uh, she managed to bring together 50 of the world's top Iran experts to offer an overview of important topics, including politics, foreign affairs, the economy, the nuclear controversy, regional relations, and U.S. policy. Uh, the entire book is on, you can find the entire book online. Uh, the, the link to it are also outside. But for those of you who would like a printed copy, please leave your name uh, with my colleague, uh, Kendra Heidemann, and next time you are at the center, if we still have copies available, we will give them to you. Otherwise, you can purchase them through USIP. Um, the project also features a website with ongoing blogs by each of the Primer's authors entitled Author Talk. The book's contributors offer brief analytical commentaries on timely events uh, regarding Iran. Uh, today's meeting, we have uh, the editor of the Primer, of course, uh, Robin, to my left, uh, Shaul Bakhash, Clarence J. Robinson, professor of history at George Mason University. He's going to go first, and Geneve uh, Abdu, who is the director and Iran, of Iran program at the Century Foundation. She will go second. And I'm sure when Robin speaks, she will talk uh, about the primer. If you have uh, any questions, you can address it uh, to her. Uh, each of our speakers will speak for 15 uh, minutes. We have distributed their bios. So therefore, I won't take much of your time because I know it's a very topical issue. And we will start with uh, Shaul. We won't let you even catch your breath. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, um, I think um, President Ahmadinejad's uh, abrupt dismissal of his foreign minister on Monday <coughs> is yet again a reminder <coughs> of the Iranian president's brash, in-your-face style, <clears throat> but it is also a sign of Ahmadinejad's growing clout in both domestic and foreign affairs. Now, of course, in Iran, the president um, enjoys the prerogative of appointing, of appointing and changing his cabinet ministers. But what made this dismissal unusual, in addition to the manner in which it was ex executed, is that the selection of the foreign minister has generally been thought to be the, uh, uh, the prerogative of the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. This certainly has been the case for the last <coughs> 20 years. We do not know whether Ahmadinejad uh, secured the permission of the leader before um, dismissing his uh, foreign minister. Um, but we do know that the president and the foreign minister have been at loggerheads over the control of foreign policy and that the foreign minister has been associated with one of the president's rivals, the Speaker of Parliament. Um, and I think we can say that even if the leader um, uh, finally agreed that Motaki, the foreign minister, should be, uh, should be set aside, uh, it is certain he did not approve the manner um, and the timing of Motaki's dismissal, which took place at a moment when the foreign minister was in Senegal on a diplomatic mission, uh, in fact carrying a letter from the Iranian president to, the, to his Senegalese uh, counterpart. 
This is certainly not the first time that um, Ahmadinejad has acted in a way that seems um, uh, openly to flout the preferences of the uh, of the leader. Um, and I wish then today to really make two points, um, two broad points. First, I think that while most analysts agree that ultimate authority in the Islamic Republic rests with the supreme leader, he is, to put it in other words, the decider, uh, the office of the president um, has also emerged um, as a center of power, certainly in the last 20 years since the abolition of the post of prime minister. Both Ahmadinejad's predecessors, two predecessors, Rafsanjani and Khamenei, also put their stamp uh, on policy and, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the whole style of government. And the second point I want to make um, is that uh, uh, the basis and exercise of presidential power by Ahmadinejad seems to be different, and that we may be witnessing a shift in the balance of power between the president and the supreme leader. Uh, first, a quick word uh, on the uh, uh, on the Rafsanjani and Khatami presidencies which preceded Ahmadinejad. We tend to forget, I think, how deep an impact on policy and style of government uh, both men had. Um, Rafsanjani, after all, moved um, Iran's foreign policy uh, to the center in a more moderate direction. He opened up the economy to foreign and domestic private investment. He began the process of privatization of state-owned enterprises. He eased social controls on women and the young. Um, although he showed little interest in liberalization, political liberalization, nevertheless the seeds of the intellectual and reformist press, um, which nurtured ideas regarding civil society and individual rights, which became so important under his successor, were planted during his administration. Um, again, um, the Khatami presidency ushered in the most significant opening up of the political sphere since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Khatami also took steps, I think the first ever, to curb the growing power of the intelligence ministry. Um, he made an overture, as we recall, um, for a dialogue with the United States, an overture which did not in the end succeed. And both these men made extensive changes in the civil service, that is, in cabinet appointments, in the appointment of governors um, of the provinces, um, uh, in the heads of agencies and organizations, and even um, in university administration. So the idea of a strong president really is not new. What then is new about <coughs> Ahmadinejad? Um, uh, first, I think um, that while the supreme leader, uh, Khamenei, was able to curb both uh, Rafsanjani and Khatami uh, during their second terms. We have seen nothing of the sort happening with Ahmadinejad. He has, in fact, consolidated his position du during his second term and has won increasing freedom of action. He continues to flout the existing constitutional system and uh, power structure. For example, he routinely ignores parliament. He has refused to implement laws passed by the Majlis. Uh, he has spent very significant uh, funds without parliamentary authorization. He has claimed to be the second most important personage in the country and therefore, according to him, uh, uh, with the authority to ignore uh, parliament. Um, the bill, for example, that uh, he presented to Parliament over the current hot subject, the end of subsidies, uh, attempted to create a huge fund entirely at his dis disposal. Um, again, we notice that his deputy, his chief deputy, Mashai, routinely raises the hackles of the senior clergy by uh, statements about the nature of Iran's 
Islamic religion, uh, and he does so with uh, impunity. Uh, President Ahmadinejad abolished the plan and budget organization and made planning and budgeting uh, a part of the uh, president's uh, uh, office. Um, and again, um, he has pursued a brashness in foreign policy uh, uh, despite the uh, criticism and grave reservations of several members of parliament and the foreign policy establishment, such as it is in Iran. I think there are a number of reasons for this freedom of action that um, uh, Ahmadinejad has been able to secure for himself. First of all, I think there is far less light than is generally supposed between Ahmadinejad and uh, the leader Khamenei um, on a number of issues. Um, Khamenei, I think, um, appreciates uh, the kind of flouting of the West and the resonance this has with the Arab street, with, in the Islamic world in general, that uh, Ahmadinejad so successfully pursues, even if the leader would have done this in a somewhat different style. Again, <coughs> Khamenei, I mean the leader Khamenei was probably less comfortable um, with the former president Khatami's more accommodating style in negotiations on the nuclear issue than he is um, uh, uh, with uh, Ahmadinejad's approach. Again, if we take Ahmadinejad's statements on the Holocaust and the, <coughs> and the uh, coming elimination of Israel, uh, these were statements, very similar ones, made by Khamenei himself in the past, although they did not cause such a public uproar um, internationally. Um, and whatever Khamenei's concerns about Ahmadinejad and his uh, independent style, clearly the leader prefers him to both the reformists and the centrists. Um, it was striking, therefore, the, 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 uh, the unflinching support that Khamenei gave Ahmadinejad after last year's contested uh, elections was quite striking. Um, on the other hand, there seems to be no doubt that um, Ahmadinejad's style and, and uh, uh, initiatives must be of some concern to the leader. Um, first of all, um, Ahmadinejad dips into that very constituency, the mass Iranian populace that um, uh, Ahmadinejad has exploited so successfully. Um, Ahmadinejad's uh, 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 liberal hand with largesse uh, to uh, Iranians in the countryside and the villages, and his anti Western uh, rhetoric, which resonates with uh, elements in the um, Iranian uh, public, uh, clearly cuts into that very constituency which Khamenei has claimed for his own. Um, secondly, Khamenei, I mean Ahmadinejad, has built up, in addition to this populist base, um, sources of support in the Revolutionary Guards, in the paramilitary forces, the Basij, in the security agencies, um, which are exactly the sources of support, the constituencies which the leader himself has cultivated very carefully um, uh, um, over, the, over the years. Uh, and and uh, while, as I say, I think um, by and large, um, Ahmadinejad's foreign policy style um, has the leader's approval. Clearly, uh, there, there are elements in that style and consequences to that style, repercussions for Iran, which uh, make the uh, le leader uncomfortable. And yet, he has been unable to curb his president. Um, and I think uh, the, the reasons are the ones I've already enumerated. That is, that Ahmadinejad has uh, managed to 
create for himself a basis of support and power um, in those constituencies which, which were the leader's own basis of support and power. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Okay, great. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thanks very much to Robin for including me in the book project and also for Hala for inviting me here. Um, I've been asked to talk about the opposition and to sort of define it and try to clarify what the opposition is, which is a tall uh, order, but I will attempt to do so in the next few minutes. Um, I think it's really important that, that we talk about this subject, um, not only in, in the book that Robin edited, but just in public debates in Washington, because there is a notion, I think, in this town that, the, that the, this movement should be narrowly defined to street protesters. And so what I'd like to point out today is that it's a much broader movement than we saw in June and July of 2009. Um, I was recently in Brussels a few weeks ago, and I also came to learn that some European policymakers think that the MKO is also part of the Green Movement. And they are now trying to actually pressure people within the Obama administration to, to, uh, 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 to, to take the MKO, the Mujahideen, off the, the terrorism list. So you can see that there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding of this movement. Um, so what actually is the Green Movement, or as it's so called, the Green Movement? Um, I think it's important, first of all, to, to note that it's not a revolutionary movement. Um, for the most part, and I'll get to some of the more details in a few minutes, but for the most part, this isn't a movement, at least as it's understood in Iran by uh, particularly its de facto leaders, a movement that should create an, a, a new revolution. Um, uh, I think that it's, it should be defined more as a social movement. It's, but at the same time, it's not sort of as we would uh, conceptualize a social movement in the West, because obviously Iran is an authoritarian state and there's widespread re repression. So this is, again, why I think this sort of calculation that's used in Washington, well, the movement is dead, the movement is in decline because there aren't three million people on the street, I think that that's an inaccurate kind of calculation because we can't really compare this movement to the kinds of social movements that are more traditional in Western societies. Um, their goal, I would say, broadly speaking, and again, I'll get to sort of what their differences are in a few minutes, but they, they advocate, obviously, fundamental change within the existing order. Um, and, of course, they're, they're advocating free speech, they're advocating a democratic process in Iran, free elections, um, and it's been interesting in how Hamenei has perceived this movement. And um, I think that because of the absolute fear of the movement as a movement that wants regime change, this is precisely why there has been so much repression. Because the regime itself fears that if, particularly Hamenei, that if he compromises on any of these major issues that the, that the opposition is calling for, um, reform of the press, this sort of thing, that this type of compromise will lead to the complete unraveling of the system. So even though you sort of have a movement that is not seeking revolution on the one hand, I think you have a regime that fears that that's the ultimate objective. Um, as we know, eventually the protests died down um, as, as they had been in June and July of 2009, and the opposition has sort of disappeared now from the headlines. Um, I wanted to just show you some of uh, a few quotes um, from one of the leaders of the movement, and I think that that she very uh, eloquently sort of describes who these people are and what their objectives are. This, of course, is Mir Hussein Mousavi's wife, and she became extremely popular right before the presidential election and the months following. And in fact. Um, are the, although it could be uh, somewhat arguable, she's probably more unpopular than he is at this point in Iran. So you can see from this quote that she says that there's nothing wrong with people expressing their views, that we've become accustomed to a society in which there's only one vote. However, we must realize that everyone should have the right to express themselves. It is this plurality and existence of various voices that is one of the main characteris characteristics of the Green Movement. 
Um, in another quote, in another quote, um, who makes up the green movement? She says that you know she describes the different layers of the movement. Um, that it's it. She says it's it's. I believe that the green movement is about what unites us. Even though our differences exist, they provide an opportunity for all of us to come together, regardless of the varying viewpoints. Um, and she goes on to talk about sort of what these differences are. And as you can see at the end of this quote, she says that we believe in the importance, for example, of returning to the fundamentals of our Constitution. So again, you can see that at least for the leadership, which we define as the leaders of the, of the Green Movement, they're talking about uh, operating within the existing constitutional framework of Iran. This is a quote from Mohammed Hatami, the Green Movement is peaceful and nonviolent. Those who want to use violence are, in my opinion, outside the framework of the system. Again, this, is, this was a, a, a goal that they successfully managed to, to really um, you know, achieve and comply with throughout the demonstrations. There wasn't much violence except for uh, the, sort of the radical fringe of the movement during all these street protests. For the most part, the opposition movement remained peaceful. So, as, as she has explained it, there are actually, there's great diversity within the movement and there are very various layers of the opposition. Um, the first layer I would call is the opposition that is operating from outside. And there are two aspects of this movement that operates outside that tries in some way to bring out, particularly into the West, the ideas of the movement and also to channel information inside because of course it's very difficult now to communicate uh, with people inside the country. These opposition figures are here in the United States. They're people such as Mohsen Kadivar who is a cleric, a renowned cleric. He was very active in Iran two, 10 years ago when President Hatami was in power. He went to, to prison for some time for his writings questioning the legitimacy of supreme clerical rule. He's here in the United States. There's also Abdul Karim Sarush, who is a philosopher, who's also living here, and Mohsen Sazagora, who has been a longtime activist in Iran. Now, I would say that their views are more radical than the views of those who exist inside <laughs> Iran. Um, there's also a layer of opposition outside that involves young people. Um, many, many young Iranians have come out of the country in the last year, and as part of the project I run, actually, um, at the Century Foundation, I have convened an advisory group or task force of a lot of these young people, most of whom are in Europe. And um, we've had two meetings so far between these young Iranians involved in the opposition and policymakers. So some of the meetings are held in Europe. There is an upcoming meeting in Munich. And the whole idea, again, is for people involved in the opposition to be able to communicate directly with governments to explain what this movement is about and what their goals are. Now, these particular people who have come out and who are in Europe, they're um, educated Iranians. They're, for the most part, in their 20s, early 30s. And they, to some degree, have sort of given up on the Islamic system of governance. They believe that Iran needs to move to a much more secular um, type of governance. And again, you can see that their views differ from those of, say, Hatami and Musavi. And what they do outside is they, they uh, run blogs, they run websites, some of them are journalists, some of them are academics, and they try to help the networks inside to disseminate information out and to also um, somehow uh, contribute to the information inside the country. Um, the second layer, I would say, of opposition inside the country is one that is most overlooked in the West, and this is the clerics. Um, as we have seen over the last year and a half, um, we've seen public criticism from the clerical establishment, and this is quite extraordinary. Um, since the revolution, there have been key clerical figures, such as the late Ayatollah Montezeri, who have been symbols of criticism and symbols of opposition to the regime. But we have not seen until the June election uh, much more mainstream clerics actually come out and publicly um, condemn the regime. Condemn the regime. Um, just recently, the most memorable um, letter 
that was published was from an ayatollah by the name of Mohammed Dasgib, and he's a prominent um, critic of the government, and he's also a, a member of the Assembly of Experts, so he's actually part of the system. And he issued a, a letter in September urging the Assembly to perform their duties according to the Iranian Constitution. And again, there's this feeling among the clerics, as there is a feeling in civil society, that what has happened since June uh, 2009, as, as Shaul explained, has gone far beyond what is constitutionally permitted in Iran. Um, the, um, the, the, the other differences within these different sort of aspects of the opposition are generational differences. And I'll get to some statistics in a few minutes of a poll that was conducted that actually show the differences between Iranians who live in urban areas versus rural areas, Iranians who are younger as opposed to those are older that are older. But I would say that that um, these generational differences have really come to light since since the election in terms of what the younger generation wants as opposed to the older generation. Um, and I think that again, this has sort of been. Um, been illustrated in a younger generation wanting to move beyond the constitutional framework and wanting a completely new system, whereas the older generation is still trying to reform the system from within. Um, now, the, the, um, the movement, the other major point I would like to make is that the movement is broad-based. It's not, we should not define it narrowly as a student movement, as was the case when I was in Iran 10 years ago, where we had um, protests, and at that time, those were the largest protests since the 79 revolution, which lasted for about five or six days. Those protests at the time were primarily organized by students. The grievances expressed were those articulated primarily by students and their organizations, and that movement had a very short shelf life. Now we're seeing a completely different situation. Um, and I think that this is why this movement, even though uh, we might think looking outside that it is in decline, that it has a much greater prospect for bringing about change in the long term. Um, the movement inside Iran that I'm talking about, which is more broad based, it includes clerics, as I mentioned. Um, there is somewhat of a sort of dilemma that the clerical establishment is facing now. On the one hand, they, they believe that what's happened in Iran is not only uh, unconstitutional but un-Islamic. Um, on the other hand, they understand that to some degree with the rise of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, as shall explain, that Khamenei is the glue keeping the system together. So. Some of the clerics, particularly mainstream ones, are now in a sort of a dilemma of how far to how how much to vocalize their criticism, because Khamenei obviously has been sort of delegitimized as a, 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 a religious figure. I mean, he was he always had problems in terms of being respected within the scholarly religious community, but now within the general population, he's obviously not respected in the same way he was before June 2009. So that's sort of the dilemma that the clerics face, even though there is growing opposition within the clerical establishment. Um, and there are other parts of, I would say, society that, we, that may not identify themselves with the so-called green movement, but what has happened since June, I think, 2009, which is very important, is that the different parts of civil society that had remained silent now feel that it's permissible to express their grievances. I mean, if you take, for example, even the merchants in the bazaar, um, in October of this year, the traditional bazaaris had a strike. They held a strike to protest Ahmadinejad's economic policies. Um, now, again, the, this is a part of the population that historically has not necessarily been opposed to the regime. Um, I think that the other, the other part of, of the opposition that we've seen much more of and that we can now say is part of the social movement against the regime are factory workers. There have been a series of strikes in Iran. Um, in fact, this week alone, according to some of the state-run news agencies, workers kicked out the management. They, they uh, kicked out the management and took charge of a factory. 
Um, and this is really sort of unheard of in Iran in terms of, you know, there was basically a, a many revolt inside one of the factories. Um, there have been also a lot of demonstrations by women. Um, and I think that, um, again, some of the policies of the regime that have been very counterproductive have now allowed people to express their grievances. Um, there was, there is actually a bill before the Majlis, the Parliament in Iran, called the Family Protection Bill, and this is a, a really extraordinary bill that will basically uh, push back a lot of the advances that women have made in Iran. For example, it it imposes heavy taxation on alimony payments to women, um, and it also requires people to uh, register if they have temporary marriages. Now, one of the reasons that this bill is locked in the parliament now is because there has been so much opposition by women to this legislation. So my general point is that what June 2009 has done to civil society is it's given all these aspects of the society some room, some political space to expect, express their grievances. And I just want to get quickly to some of the polling data to let to give you some idea of where, the, the question that's always asked is, what part of society is with the regime and what part is with the opposition? And if you look at some of these statistics, this was a poll conducted just recently by the International Peace Institute, which is located in New York. And the findings of this poll, I think, tell us that society is split down the middle. Um, if you look at Iran's public is sharply split on the government's performance, you can see that that in fact it is quite split and to the right you will see sort of the gender breakout and also the, um, the breakout according to region and you can see as, as the findings indicate below that there's far less support um, in urban areas for the regime as opposed to rural areas. There's far less support among those who are educated as opposed to those who are more educated. Um, so I, I think that some of these statistics are quite important. And because we're running out of time, if you'd like to see the poll in its entirety, it's on the website of the International Peace Institute. And I'll just go through some of this quickly. Um, Iranians are divided equally on the presence of free speech, rule of law, and desirability of morality police. So you can see some of the questions here that were asked and also the results. And this is sort of precisely why it's a bit difficult to determine the future in terms of how, what the future of the Green Movement will be. I think that this is a very interesting slide. It shows you that, in fact, former President Rafsanjani has a pretty high favorability reading in Iran, um, as opposed to Musavi and Karubi, which had lower percentages. Again, we see from this statistic that society is pretty split down the middle in terms of their support for um, theocratic rule. And I think this is the last one. The, just to give you some idea of the methodology, this particular poll was conducted by interviewing Iranians from a phone bank in Istanbul, um, which obviously, you know, it casts a bit of doubt on the the methodology, but nonetheless, because, because of the difficulty of actually polling Iranians inside the country, I think still the, the poll is, is has some value. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Robin, I think you too have to switch oh, okay, places please. because of the computer. Thank you. Let's see. Kendra? How do I do it so it's just on this screen? You can use this if you want. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much for coming uh, to help us celebrate the launch of the Iran Primer. Uh, it's a really exciting project, not just because it's in bound form, but because it's a living project. Uh, on the web, we have all 62 chapters, as well as every two days we post another new piece responding to some breaking news development uh, by one of the 50 authors. And eventually all 50 authors will have their own 
web page or web presence um, or blog on the Iran Primer site, and the site is just simply iranprimer.com. And so it's, uh, you get access to the whole book, uh, all the appendices full of uh, really rich, important timelines, uh, rundown on Iran's nuclear facilities and so forth, um, but also very fresh analysis uh, that, that isn't appearing anyplace else. I decided, um, oh, and for anybody who hasn't seen it, this is our, our baby. Um, what I wanted to do was something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to talk about U.S. diplomacy and trying to get Iran to engage on its nuclear program. And I decided that I'd try uh, to do this through pictures. And I found that the most interesting pictures uh, are all political cartoons. So that's what I have uh, to show you, because I think they're an interesting reflection of public mood, um, editorial sentiment, uh, and kind of the, some of the challenges ahead. Um, so. Uh, it's clear that President Obama is genuinely committed to trying the diplomatic uh, option for many reasons. I think the drain on uh, the United States from its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the problems facing the military, um, if we or Israel should strike uh, Iran, there would be repercussions on U.S. forces in neighboring Afghanistan and Iraq. And of course, I think looming in the back of his mind is the issue of the Nobel Peace Prize. Here's a guy who has inherited two wars, is trying to get, figure out a way to end them, uh, and does not want to go out of office having uh, started a third war front. Last week, the world's major powers, uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, uh, launched a new diplomatic effort in Geneva. It was a sequel to the October 2009 meeting, um, which broke down after Iran first accepted a formula designed to help build confidence and also address an issue that it faced, a problem it faced, in providing fuel to a research reactor in Tehran um, that is used largely for medical purposes. Uh, but Iran turned around a few days after accepting it and rejecting it. Um, and so this undermined uh, the kind of confidence the U.S. was trying to build. The new talks were or organized by the European Union. Uh, this is Lady Catherine a Ashton and uh, the Iranian delegation led by Saeed J uh, Jalili, who is effectively Iran's national security advisor. Uh, they achieved in a, nothing in a tangible form except an agreement to hold a second round of talks sometime in late January, probably in Istanbul. The U.S. had hoped for bilateral talks with Iran on the sidelines of the Geneva meeting, but this didn't happen. The United States wanted to use the opportunity both to get beyond the kind of stereotyped um, freeze in relations symbolized by this picture, which is from the wall outside the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, and also as a venue to take up other issues, such as human rights. Um, Iran's failure to accept the one-on-one -on -one kind of talks uh, with a U.S. representative posed the ultimate question behind this diplomatic effort. Um, is the Iranian regime really willing or even able to engage in serious rapprochement, given the divisions within the regime that Shaul uh, described, uh, especially when it comes to the United States, and because uh, enmity toward the United States has actually been uh, a defining issue for the revolutionaries, especially for Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, Skeptics rightly express concern that Iran is simply baiting the United States, the Obama administration, and taking advantage of a diplomatic overture while it pursues its own covert activities. After years of disagreement, and I meant to tell the cameraman to p focus on the cartoons so those watching can get a sense of what I'm talking about. But after years of, of disagreement, there is unprecedented consensus among the world's major powers, including notably Russia and China, that Iran is not telling the full truth about its program. 
because of the discovery of an additional secret facility in Qom, as well as Iran's uh, continued development of uh, medium and long-range missiles, which is often not focused on as much as the uh, pr problem of uranium enrichment. Iran now has the largest and most diverse ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. Israel has more capable ballistic missiles, um, but fewer in number and in type. Iran is the only country to develop a missile with a range of 2,000 kilometers, which takes it deep into Europe, without first having developed a nuclear weapon. And of course, that's one of the many issues that has led to questions. Um, Iran's rhetoric, uh, especially under hardline President Ahmadinejad, has deeply eroded Iran's credibility, um, particularly in Europe and uh, with Russia and even China to, to a degree and led to concerns that any nuclear program is not just for deterrence, as many once assumed, but actually to help convert Iran into one of the new middle layer, uh, middle power powers in the world, uh, countries like Brazil and India and Turkey. Uh, the current diplomatic framework doesn't offer much encouragement since it's rather open-ended. In fact, as I listened to uh, the briefings after the talks in Geneva, it hauntingly reminded me of the kind of process we're engaged in on the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's open-ended. Uh, in this case, the agenda isn't even finalized. And it allows uh, Iran to keep on doing its own business, particularly um, preventing tougher UN inspections. Iran's long history of whimsical excuses for its actions, beginning with taking the U.S. Embassy uh, hostage after the U.S. admitted the dying Shah for medical treatment, including a fatwa against Salman Rushdie for a book, um, uh, and, of course, the protests it called for after the publication of a Danish cartoon makes it a highly unpredictable negotiating partner. You never know what whimsical little reason the Iranians may come up with to walk out or to balk at agreements. Um, the, uh, Iran also has a long history of saying one thing and doing another. Uh, note the missiles in the background as well as the vultures. Uh, under Ahmadinejad, Iran has had its own carrot and stick policy that has often deeply confused the outside world um, and, uh, as yet, led to deepening disagreement and animosity uh, with the outside world. Uh, in the last week, Iran particularly has talked about downgrading relations with Britain. Iran has also shown no interest in compromise on its nuclear program, especially uranium enrichment. And it's already declared, literally within 24 hours of the meeting in Geneva last week, that it will not discuss uranium enrichment at the January talks, uh, which doesn't give much hope for progress at the second round either. And that is likely to frustrate the kind of diplomatic initiative that President Obama has pledged since uh, running for the presidency, uh, and likely to deepen the political divide as well. Iran's argument, of course, is that it's not breaking the rules of the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and, doing, and not doing anything that the ma major powers are already doing themselves. Now, one of the tragedies in the midst of these talks is that they are so focused on Iran's nuclear program that other critical issues are being neglected, particularly the issue of human rights, at a time that Iran's human rights record is worse than at any time since the immediate aftermath of the 1979 revolution. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that I'm pessimistic. and. Uh, as many of you who know me, I'm normally uh, kind of optimistic about Iran, but the reason, one of the reasons I'm pessimistic is I think that the nuclear program has become, in the last 18 months, totally wrapped up in domestic politics. It is an issue that at one time 
uh, when it, the program was started, was designed to, to give Iran some power in the region to balance it off against Iraq, which was then working on its own nuclear program. But in the last 18 months, a very vulnerable regime, despite its militarization, um, its political militarization, uh, has has felt that being able to claim that they have a nuclear capability or even a weapon itself gives greater credibility and legitimacy to the regime. So there are now domestic reasons, not just regional security reasons, for pursuing uh, a nuclear uh, capability. Uh, the nuclear program has also become an, an issue in terms of Iran's own self-image. Again, how powerful is it? Is it becoming one of the mid-level powers? And meanwhile, as diplomacy slowly ticks, there, is, there are other clocks that are increasing pressure, um, particularly in Israel, but right across the board. The issue of timing is so key right now, and Iran's um, or Israel's pledge that it will not allow Iran to get either a capability or a weapon, and it will take action if it needs to. And that's going to complicate uh, anything the United States tries. And if there is no agreement at these talks, that will then force the United States to go back to the United Nations in search of a fifth resolution uh, on sanctions. And this is going to be much tougher than anything the U.S. has engaged in before because of uh, China. Right, don't worry, I've, I've only got a couple more slides. Um, uh, which buys 12% uh, of its energy supplies today from uh, Iran. That is a relationship that has developed um, economically and politically. And the prospect of the United States getting unanimity among the, the five permanent members of the Security Council for a tougher resolution, particularly one that deals with Iran's oil and gas supplies or its ability to import the refined oil to run its own industries, um, is going to be very, very tough. Uh, and of course, Western sanctions also offer Iran an opportunity to blame the West for its own economic mismanagement and its own problems. It's due at any time now to uh, start a five-year phased process of removing subsidies, which is likely to create even greater economic problems uh, for average Iranian. Inflation rates are always already going up just in anticipation of subsidy removal. And of course, that leaves the other option of uh, the military. And I, my understanding from talking with senior administration officials is that while that option is on the table, even though they don't want to talk about it, it's not something that the, this administration wants to engage in for uh, a multitude of re reasons. The danger, of course, is what does that leave us? And that's, uh, that leaves only containment, possibly uh, getting other countries other banks not to do business with Iran, trying to curtail, but that kind of effort takes time. I lived in Southern Africa for seven years, and it took 15 years for international sanctions to work against Rhodesia, a country that was landlocked and didn't have oil. Uh, sanctions, financial restrictions will take even longer. And the danger is if in the meantime the region doesn't feel that it's uh, safe or secure because of Iran's program, that then opens up what we don't want to see, and that's a regional arms race. And there's already talk about that kind of um, c program among a, a variety of countries. And once you cross that threshold with Iran and the region, then it's hard to hold back other middle-level powers as well. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you to all three panelists. Uh, we have half an hour time for uh, questions. Could I ask you to pose very brief questions and no comments? I'm afraid I will interrupt you if you just give us some comment, just brief questions. Yes, please. And just wait for the mic and identify yourself. Thank you. Anna Newby. 
Anna Newby with the Project on Middle East Democracy. I have a question for Dr. Abdo. Um, you highlighted pretty extensively the diversity of the opposition in Iran and outside the country. And sort of for the sake of playing devil's advocate, I kind of want to ask why it even makes sense for us to talk about the opposition as a movement, because by calling it the Green Movement, that sort of suggests that all of these diverse actors are interacting and cooperating in some sort of organized way. Well, I think that we, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the general point that I was making, is that fundamentally something really important has happened in Iran. Um, that's the upside. The downside, to some degree, is that this isn't a coherent movement, in quotes. I mean, but I think that, that that's almost an irrelevant question at this point, um, because obviously if we are looking at some sort of transformation, uh, political transformation, that it is important that this is a diverse uh, movement. Um, and, and, and over time, obviously, you know, there's going to be fundamental change unless, for example, I mean, the Revolutionary Guards takes power or something like that. But, but I think that what we have seen, particularly since uh, June 2009, is that we have seen, as I said, political space open up so that all of these different social groups within society can express their grievances. So we've crossed a red line, and that's very important. Comment on this? Michelle, any comment on that? Um, yes, please. Uh, just wait for the mic. Thank you. Hugh McElrath, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Question for um, Dr. Abdo. It's very confusing. The Unfortunately, I'm not a doctor, but. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, you had alluded that, to the, the idea that there is some question about the polling data. And I just remember when I was in Iran uh, before the revolution, people would only whisper the name Sabak, you know. So what do you think, and anecdotally I guess is the only way you can say, of, of whether someone receiving a phone call from Istanbul will answer candidly? Well, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the big question, and that's why it's so difficult to understand, you know, sort of public opinion in Iran. Um, I can only tell you that from my own experience in working um, with a few researchers on, on, on the project um, over the last two or three years, that we can't really say categorically that people aren't truthful on the phone. I mean, we call people all, you know, every week in Iran. Um, of course, we've developed relationships with people inside and outside. But so I think it's, you know, on the one hand, yes, you know, that's why I said I, 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 I'm cautious about all polling data. I mean, I think that survey research now is used far too loosely to determine that Muslims think this and Arab societies think that, you know. But, um, but I think that in this case, the reason I showed this data is that I think that generally speaking, my own view from, you know, some contact with people inside the country is that the society is split down the middle. I mean, that's the way it appears. Um, and that's what this data reflects. And I think that the, the more um, overarching sort of main um, themes of the generational divide, the gender divide, the rural urban divide, that's reflected in this polling data. And that's why I showed it, because I think that from what we know at this point, about where public opinion stands, you know, versus the regime, that that's, it's fairly accurate, generally speaking. Yes, please. Ahmed Subhi Mansour. Mr. Shawal, thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, raise some uh, questions. Questions, yes. yes. Just yes. one <laughs> question, I because know. we have, yes, please. About the image, uh, why Ahmed and Iraq is so strong in, uh, in Iran. I, I have uh, some reasons, and please correct me if uh, there is something wrong. But, uh, is this because he is a very simple man, simple man who has a very a simple life, like, you, know, you can find any Iranian uh, ordinary, ordinary person finds himself in Ahmadinejad, 
uh, who is not interested in the vanity of this life, this, or uh, because Ahmad Inyad has a, big, uh, a very good image in Muslim streets, and because Ahmad Inyad has many sentences against Israel, uh, three, uh, it is to, because of the minority, Arab Sunni minority, persecuted in the south of Iran, and their cry reach out many places, and they want uh, uh, to uh, ignore them by the image of Ahmadinejad as one is a popul very popular in Muslim street, or uh, uh, because uh, uh, Iran, Iran now plans to uh, take over Iraq after the America this is wrong. Thank you. <laughs> no comment. <to> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I, th I think uh, I, mean, I should s simply say what I think are the basis of, of Ahmadinejad's uh, popularity and support in Iran. I think you're right that he, he won the election partly because he was a, a man from a simple background and a humble life and uh, not rich like his opponent, uh, uh, Rafsanjani. He has been very good at playing to the, to the popular um, image. Um, after all, the, 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 uh, uh, his liberality with uh, funds for local projects, for um, um, poor couples getting married, that sort of thing um, has gone off well. Secondly, um, I think, as I said, uh, his, his, his rhetoric of standing up to the United States, of uh, standing up for Iranian identity and nationalism uh, has resonated with a certain uh, uh, element in the, uh, in the uh, Iranian, uh, uh, in the Iranian uh, public. And he has been very good about traveling around the country and uh, meeting with people, making speeches, promising projects. Um, and th that kind of thing. I really, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't think I quite understood your points about um, the, the Arab minority in, in Iran. Uh, and I don't think Ahmadinejad's popularity has much to do with um, I Iran's intention, if it has such an intention, to take over Iraq, as you put it. Um, Iran is obviously has influence in Iraq, and uh, Ahmadinejad. Um, uh, plays up this idea that Iran is, a, is not only an important regional power but a player um, on the wor world stage. And of course, this resonates with the, and certainly elements in the Iranian public as well. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, but Thank you. I, this uh, question is to any of the panelists. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentations. My name is Brian Newberry. I'm a scholar here at the center. Um, any sense from your contacts with uh, government officials or your own sense whether the Wik WikiLeaks information that's come out recently about the regional actors, whether or not that will affect uh, their support for the United States actions in the future, or do you think it's just a minor bump on the road and, and they'll continue to be supportive behind the scenes? Thank you. Robin, you go first. Uh, none of us have been in the inner circle to, tell, to hear the conversations. It'd be quite interesting. I think I was a little surprised when Amin Nejad came out so quickly and kind of dismissed the WikiLeaks uh, and actually thought it was part of a propaganda move by the United States on the eve of talks. Uh, frankly, when you, if I'm a longstanding diplomatic correspondent, and when I looked, read through some of them, I wasn't really all that surprised, and I don't think the Iranians were all that surprised by the things the Saudis said. Um, so, you know, relations have been have gone through their ups and downs between Iran and its regional partners. Uh, I don't think they've ever kind of stabilized. They, uh, so, I'm not convinced that they, that they affect anything in a major way, one way or the other. Um, I'll just add briefly. I think that one reason that Ahmadinejad um, responded so quickly is that the the uh, cables from, of course, Arab leaders were very negative toward Iran, and he has tried desperately in the last several months visiting Lebanon, um, uh, Maliki visited Tehran. He's tried really throughout his presidency to tr to convince his own population of his popularity in the Arab world. So I think that um, that was somewhat of a blow to him personally. Chode, do you have anything? I, I, no, 
Thank you. I'm uh, Benjamin Tua, a retired bureaucrat, and this is for Dr. Bakash and any of the other panels that would like to uh, comment. Uh, apart from the domestic considerations in the designation of the new foreign minister to be, uh, he's a graduate, I understand, of MIT. He has a graduate degree. He understands the United States well. And hasn't he also been their man at the IAEA for a long time? What does this suggest for the intentions of the Iranians vis-a-vis -vis the dialogue with the United States on the nuclear issue plus the broader P5 plus one dialogue? I think it's a very good question and we don't have the answer. Um, uh, uh, obviously, Saleh is, is a man also who uh, the leader trusts because of the earlier positions that, that he had that he held, and uh, clearly is articulate, he speaks English very well. Um, he, um, I think, has been better at dealing with foreign interlocutors than, uh, than Motaki, and possibly one of the reasons that he was chosen as the replacement is precisely this, his ability to engage uh, <clears throat> with uh, his Western interlocutors uh, in, a, in a better way. But whether it indicates any change in Iran's position on the nuclear issue, I'd be very doubtful. And I think, as, as Robin pointed out, I Iran's insistence on its right to uh, enrichment on Iranian uh, t territory is not going to change. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, un until that Iranian requirement, as it were, is conceded, I don't think the talks will go anywhere. I agree with you. I mean, I think both the President and the Secretary of State have indicated indirectly that the U.S. might be willing to accept some enrichment um, on Iranian soil, provided Iran suspends enrichment now uh, in order for these talks to take place. So there may be some give there, but, you know, we're really not there yet. Yeah. Um, may I just add one word to it? Mr. Saleh, he was appointed as a caretaker and not as foreign minister. And if he wants to nominate him as foreign minister, he has only three months. And we don't know whether in three months he's going to appoint him as the foreign minister. For the time being, he's a caretaker. Kind of a can, can I just add one thing? He's, he's not, you know, in charge of the negotiations with the West. That's Jalili. And so um, I've interviewed Salahi a couple of times. He is very uh, approachable, very accessible, very – I've found him surprisingly candid uh, about some of these issues. And he clearly has um, more kind of one-on-one -on -one personal charisma uh, than Motaki did, uh, who is not a strong interlocutor with anyone. Uh, so – but we, we can't over – evaluate or estimate what impact he might have on the talks because he's not the one leading them. Okay, I'd like to, oh yes, I saw a hand in the back. <laughs> Hi, uh, Raj Srinivasan with uh, Johns Hopkins Size. Um, question on, on the extent to which the Iranian diaspora um, actually aligns itself with the current regime. Um, how much support does the uh, does uh, uh, Ahmadinejad enjoy among the diaspora outside, and 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 what extent does the diaspora influence uh, uh, the uh, the actions of the current regime? Uh, I, I think there are th three large groupings in this diaspora. <clears throat> um, one is the diaspora in mostly to be found in Los Angeles and California which is dead against the regime. And it's become more and more like the Cuban exiles in Miami, who, you know, who have nothing good to say at all about uh, Cuba and, and who uh, oppose any move at improving relations between Iran and uh, the U.S. and Cuba. I think you have a similar element among the diaspora, mostly in, in, uh, uh, in, in California. And then you have a second element, as, as uh, Gen Geneva just said, of, of, uh, um, of opposition groups in the diaspora now. These are the young people, students, and some very prominent figures in Iran in the past who are now exiles and abroad, such as the cleric Kadivar, the philosopher Surush, and, and many others. But there is, I would 
say, a very large element in the diaspora that is comfortable with the Islamic Republic. Um, I was uh, uh, surprised, for example, when uh, uh, Khatami became president and had a very large reception for, in New York for Iranians in this country. Um, what a very large element of a kind of a middle class um, Iranians were there and clearly very supportive, not just of Khatami himself, but um, of the regime as a whole. So I don't think it's a united, it's a united diaspora. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Alan Kieswitter with CNO Resources. I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts about how sanctions uh, could force a recalculation uh, of Iranian nuclear policy. Do you see it through popular uprisings? Do you see it through pressure on the regime that uh, causes the regime to change the policy itself, a removal of the, now the foreign minister, but you know, the Ahmadinejad, the linkage is not there in the administration's many explanations of this, and I'd appreciate your thoughts. Robbie? Uh, I actually think that Iran is increasingly vulnerable economically, and when you look at the pattern of recent history, whether it's the collapse of apartheid in South Africa or communism in the Soviet Union, uh, at the end of the day, it was ec the economic realities that was the was the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. Apartheid, you just was the regime just couldn't afford anymore. Um, three sets of everything for the three sets of races, and in a globalizing world, communism was not viable. Uh, you had to open up to be competitive. Uh, and I think Iran faces some of those great challenges uh, as well. And I think that while the sanctions per se by the United States have had almost no effect, because we're still selling them goods, uh, uh, things exempted under sanctions like medical uh, goods, education, foodstuffs, uh, things like that. Um, EU sanctions have had more of an impact, but the thing that's really squeezed them are the financial sanctions. It's the first time we've tried this new experiment uh, on any country, and that is to go to banks and, and financial institutions around the world and say, look, Iran is in violation of banking practices. It has nothing to do with terrorism, and um, it's just that they can't account for where the money all came from, and whether it's that Iran is unable to do that or unwilling to do that because it, it's laundering its own funds. Uh, over 100 international financial ins institutions have stopped doing business, and that makes it very hard for Iran to buy raw materials for its industries, uh, to do any kind of transaction in dollars. Uh, in the meantime, you have the subsidy issue that um, uh, Jenny referred to, and this, I think, is where you may see people griping more and more active than at any time since the uh, uprising after the election uh, was quashed, that, that people are very concerned about their pocketbooks. Just to give you a couple of basic facts, the average family gets $4,000 a year in subsidies. It's cheaper today to buy a liter of gasoline than uh, uh, some bottled water. The average income is about $3,600. So you're talking about people making more from subsidies than they get from working. And even though this is a phased subsidy removal that will take five years, the first phase is, you know, 20 percent. And the Iranians w are very sensitive to pocketbook issues. And I think at the end of the day that it's not going to be the kind of moving ideology or resentment against the regime that we saw over voter fraud issues, that it's more likely to be economics that actually uh, forces the, the regime, not sanctions necessarily, but the mismanagement from within and these very novel uh, financial restrictions imposed that make it very hard for Iran to do business with the outside world. Um, I would just, I'll just add that th that's also the issue that is splitting the regime from inside as well. Um, if you read a few weeks ago, 
um, some of the members of parliament actually initiated what we might call impeachment proceedings against Ahmadinejad for his mismanagement of the economy. So we're seeing also not only that this is, as Robin explained, inspiring the population, and as I mentioned, you know, the strikes in factories and so forth, but it's also been a huge issue that has enabled Ahmadinejad's opponents within the regime to actually try to, you know, take action against him. You, I'm going to, okay, uh, just, but I'll have the last question, yes. finally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hugh McElrath, PNNL again, just to follow up on the economic thing. Um, so it's been said that, you know, various governments that we don't like, um, Venezuela, Russia, I Iran, uh, do poorly at $70 a barrel, but at $120 a barrel, they're kind of okay. Have you thought about what happens when the price of oil goes back up? Well, that's why Ahmadinejad had so much money. Uh, you know, I think it's 75 percent of all of Iran's oil income since the revolution has been made since he took office because so much because the price is so high. Uh, and as it comes down, he's been more in trouble because he spent so much of the oil reserve fund uh, in large as to, you know, the poor, the, the oppressed, and so forth. Um, Iran needs somewhere around $70, uh, $80 to kind of break even uh, because of the quality of its uh, oil. Um, and it also has to, to pay to, to uh, refineries overseas, particularly in India, to refine oil to bring it back because they don't have the refineries for themselves. So, um, you know, the higher the price of oil, the more leverage that Ahmadinejad has. Um, but whether he uses it wisely, you know, they still have the subsidies issues that have been they've been trying to deal with for uh, over 20 years since the end of the Iran-Iraq War, and no president has been willing to do it. And now they have no choice but to do it. Um, question to both of you. Um, the parliamentary elections in Iran are going to be in less than uh, two years. And we know that the current parliament is giving a lot of problems, is making a lot of trouble for uh, the president. Um, how do you think the Council of Guardian is going to react to the candidacy of the opposition? And from your talk to these young people who come from Iran, do they feel that people are not interested in going to the poll, that they believe that it's going to be, again, manipulated, rigged? Or, uh, Robin, do you think that Ahmadinejad is going to push for a solution on the nuclear issue one way or the other to attract the people who are necessarily, you know, do not agree with his position or not opposed to him, you know, like what he did after the election, uh, nominating three women to his cabinet, two were rejected, one was approved. So he went out to get back some of the women constituency he lost. Do you think he is sort of manipulating all these things? Um, I think that, uh, I mean, it's a really good question, and I think that, that most definitely people are going to not vote in, you know, the elections. I mean, I, it, w what we're hearing is how disillusioned, you know, people are. Um, of course, they don't think that their vote counts, and, and unfortunately, that works, you know, in the regime's favor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, I think given what's happened in the parliament, I would assume that the Guardian Council is going to do everything in its power to cancel anyone from the election rolls who even remotely could, you know, be sort of in, in the Larajani sort of camp that you know, that, that is opposed to Ahmadinejad in the parliament. So I think that, that, that the, I mean, I think that the problem the government will have, though, is, you know, historically they've always tried to maintain that the elections are legitimate. So it's going to be a big problem for them now if people don't go to the polls, voter turnout is low, um, and guardian council canceling everyone, how can they then keep up this facade, this pretense that the elections are, are at least legitimate? Uh, one of the reasons Ahmadinejad won was because so many people boycotted the election 
the, young, the youth call for a boycott uh, because they were so disillusioned with the fact that President Khatami had not delivered on any major reforms. And that helped put Amini Najat in power. Um, but I do think one of the things, and I'm sorry Shell's gone, but one of the most interesting thing is that even within the inner circle, there are so many divisions uh, that you can see conservatives running on a kind of anti Amini Najad uh, ticket. And that it always surprises me. I mean, who would have thought that Khatami would be, you know, a great reformer? There's a body out there that doesn't have a head most of the time, and it latches on to whoever is, seems the most viable, as they did in 1997 with Khatami, and they did uh, uh, last year with Amir uh, Hussein Musavi, who, frankly, is one of the most boring politicians. <laughs> I went to one of his uh, campaign rallies, and I, you know, I had to struggle to stay awake. Um, he, but he was seen as somebody who could, might be willing to take on the supreme leader. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that there is some diversity among conservatives. And at the end of the day, that is probably the only way you're going to push aside the hardliners. It's not the reform movement, the green movement that's going to be able to do it. It has to come, I, I, I suspect, um, from people who are pretty high up in power right now. Uh, please. Uh join me in thanking the panelists. Unfortunately, Shaul had to leave early because he's meeting with a group of high school students in Virginia. So I